Okay, I guess we'll get started. Bienvenue. Thank you everyone for coming to the 26th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in the industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. The series brings forward critical approaches to publishing practices, communication strategies, and techniques for making research dissemination more accessible. Right now, we're in our second season. Season two will build on the themes of the earlier series, but will also ask questions about sustainability, maintenance, right to repair, and the power of speculative futures. The series will be divided into three major themes, challenges for feminist and accessible publishing and technologies, sustaining and social justice, sustainability, right to repair and maintenance, and toolkits, workshops applying the lessons of the speaker series. As we seek to draw attention to power relations that have long been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. We are currently located, at least I am, and the series is located on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts at Unistodan make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university, McGill University, is where I am located and the series is located. Um, this university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved other human beings, indigenous and black individuals. These histories are here with us in this room, even in this virtual space, and inform the kinds of conversations that we have today. The series was made possible thanks to our many funders. A special thanks to the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies, NOU, the Indigenous Futures Lab, the Intersectionality Research Hub, MILA, the Black Feminist Futures Working Group, Cinema Politica, and more. Please check out our website and social media for a list of upcoming talks. On November 4th, Meredith Broussard will be speaking, and on November 11th, Joy Lisi Rankin will be speaking. Also, next week, we are hosting a talk, a fireside chat with Alice Wong, talking about her latest book, Disability Visibility. We have videos of past events and information of future events on our website and social media. All of our events are free to attend, open to the public, and while virtual, professionally captioned. Thank you today to our captionist, Paulette. For this event, recording is enabled, so the event can be posted on YouTube and later embedded on our website. Don't worry, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option available in the box below. So throughout the talk, you may type your questions into the question and answer box, and there will be some time at the end for Dr. McLean to answer them. So now for today's event. Dr. Jess McLean does research on how humans, more than humans, environments, and technologies interact to produce geographies of change. Her research focuses on digital technologies, feminist geographies, water politics, climate action, and activism. She's a senior lecturer at Macquarie University in New South Wales, Australia, where she currently teaches Anthropocene politics, planning placements, and indigenous geographies. Her book, Changing Digital Geographies, Technologies, Environments, and People was published this year in 2020, and she's co-editor-in-chief of the Digital Geography and Society Journal. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jess McLean. Thank you. I turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Alex. That's a really lovely welcome. I'll start by sharing my screen. So today, as Alex said, I'm speaking from country belonging to the Watamadigal clan of the Darug people, land that always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to elders past, present. I invite members of the audience to think about the multiple Indigenous countries that they inhabit as well as we talk here today. I'd like to thank Professor Alex Ketchum, Sophie Ogilvie and the Feminist and Accessible Publishing and Tech Speaker Series for the opportunity to talk with you today. It's a real delight. 
it's very exciting to be a part of this broader program. I'll be talking today about the environmental costs and benefits of digital technologies. I'm not a technologist or an early adopter, so this talk comes a little from the outside. As a geographer, I'm really keen to argue for a more holistic approach to issues arising from digital technologies and their environmental costs and benefits. This photo shows a white male hand holding a smartphone with an image of a calistamine bloom or a bottle brush as it's more commonly known in Australia. Without the context around the phone, you might assume that the smartphone image is of a bloom that is in the right place at the right time. However, the context that is captured by another camera shows that the image is contrived and that the calistamine bloom probably did not come from the shrubs surrounding it. This image was taken outside the calistamine's flowering season. I asked for it to be taken to illustrate some of the ways that meanings are distorted in digital spaces and it came from a florist arrangement with thanks to Katie McLean for taking the photo. The distortions that the digital enable may be generative or destructive. They are contingent. This piece of digital representation captures some of the hidden processes and meanings that emerge when we pull apart the digital and analyse what it actually is remaking. So early promises of digital technologies to free us from environmental costs by claims such as paperless offices commonly shape understandings in the current day of digital sustainability. With digital spaces firmly entrenched in everyday life and continuing to extend their reach, the challenge to make the digital sustainable, however, really lies in wait. Digital technologies are frequently framed as a solution to environmental, social and political dilemmas. This talk questions the assumptions underlying such practices and argues that more needs to be done to ensure the digital is sustainable rather than a contributing agent to the Anthropocene. The politics of the Anthropocene are contested and partially produced by digital contexts, both conceptually and physically. At the same time, digital production, consumption and storage are not frequently core concerns when evaluating the sustainability of everyday life in the Anthropocene. This image is a simplified digital ecosystem from The Guardian from some five years ago. And I include it here to get us to start thinking about the broader infrastructure that supports the mundane digital technologies that we use all the time. Digital spaces are full of contradictions. They can enable connection and community building on the one hand, while marginalizing and silencing on the other. The contingencies of digital spaces are a product of discursive and material processes that intertwine to remake human and more than human relations. In her Shadow Places piece, Plumwood, an environmental humanities theorist, critiques the dematerialization of place as it enables us to become more and more out of touch with the material conditions, including ecological conditions, that support or enable our lives. That which is shadowed is not immediately obvious, and therefore may not warrant attention or recognition. The digital is similarly prone to dematerialization. We can forget that cloud computing, for instance, does consume energy and needs data centers for storage because we imagine the digital as nebulous or virtual. Feminist new materialist perspectives are really helpful here, especially Jane Bennett's work on vibrant matter. And this helps us start thinking about digital solutionism and digital geographies more broadly. We know that non-human things are affected by digital, human digital lives, not least because of the increasing amount of carbon that digital technologies consume. And taken together, theorists, including Plumwood and Bennett, give ways to rethink how digital technologies sit in relation to humans and more than humans. So how then can we take these vibrant materiality and shadow places approaches into conversation with the digital? Or well, we could think of the places and technologies that are distanced in digital geographies within the context of digital shadows. So this slide captures a form of digital solutionism that is from a Fujitsu report. Fujitsu is an Australian IT company. They produced a green IT report every year up until about 2014, which is somewhat telling in and of itself that they're no longer being produced. In one of their more recent reports, I think it was 2014, Qantas pilots were flagged as being environmental advocates because they were using iPads rather than carrying around 20 kilogram of flight manuals. 
They said that with the amount of flights made each year and the reduced weight of the manuals, Qantas calculated this form of technology enablement enables the company to save $1.5 million annually in jet fuel. A very simple cost benefit analysis. If we bring that to bear onto this issue of iPads replacing 20 kilogram flight manuals would suggest that we haven't done the full equation here. We don't know if the iPads are actually more environmentally sustainable. We do know that carbon emissions are being affected by the reduction of these um, this weighty flight manuals, but we don't know because we haven't factored in the actual iPads as to whether the environmental costs are outweighing the benefits. Um, sorry, the environmental benefits are outweighing the costs in this instance. So as digital technologies increase their slippery tentacles deeper into everyday lives and data consumption rates continue to increase, we are right to be skeptical of some of these claims, I think. We could also bring to mind whether the substitution of bytes for books is a form of, strictly speaking, digital solutionism as Kunzman and Rattle suggest. So returning to this idea of shadow places, we often don't see or recognise many of the key components of digital ecosystems that produce the facility to access the internet. Wires and cables run underground and across ocean floors, satellites circulating space, data centres are disguised in the urban landscape as glossy structures such as this data centre in Northern Sydney, or representation of that data centre. And Wi-Fi appears to just float in the ether or um, not when it doesn't work. But data centers are a major contributor to the carbon footprint of digital technologies as they store data, help with data recovery and backup and networking of computers around the world. So according to British Open University professor John Norton, data centers make up about 50% of all energy consumed by digital ecosystems. Personal devices, another 34%, and the industries responsible for manufacturing them, about 16%. Thinking about one particular form of digital technology, artificial intelligence, some really interesting research from Strubel as well last year found that training a large AI model emits five times as much carbon as what one car, including fuel, does over a person's lifetime on average. So when we think about the political and economic costs and benefits of artificial intelligence, we should probably start thinking somewhat more about the environmental impacts as well. Another bit of interesting research comes from the International Energy Agency, which reports that Bitcoin mining uses more energy than some countries such as Austria and Colombia. These forms of analysis of data on data generation really challenge us to think again about whether these claims of sustainability with our digital lives are actually valid. In Australia, as in other nations around the world, the discourses of sustainability play a role in shaping how corporations operate. For example, one communication company here called Optus produced a sustainability scorecard a couple of years ago. Uh, this communication company, which provides internet access amongst other things, tries to demonstrate that what it means to be sustainable, but it does so in very constrained sorts of ways. Gender is presented in a quite binary way, Communities are framed very simplistically, and an intersectional analysis reveals that various categories of differences are kept separate and concretized rather than considered as interrelated. So further, even on a basic emissions level, we can see that Optus is producing um, more carbon emissions annually. So even on that basic kind of a level, we can see an example of a corporation trying to be digitally sustainable, but coming up quite short. One way that I've been conceptualising the contradictions of digital technologies is with this idea of the more than real. First published uh, on this idea of the more than real in feminist geographic work with Sophia Mousen and Alana Gresh a couple of years ago and been building this um, idea through various different case studies. The more than real is assembled from multiple elements and produces powerful effects. As a concept, it is inspired by geographers' work on the more than human, for example, Sarah Watmore's. Like the more than human notion and how it emphasizes material interconnections of humans and non-humans in the world, the more than real inverts the diminishing that accompanies use of the terms such as virtual and immaterial as applied to digital spaces. Moving away from tendencies to place these realms as inferior or not real and in opposition to the real. 
So this idea draws on Sedgwick's writing in Thought Feeling. The more than real sits beside thinking about real and digital geographies, not beyond or behind such work, in an effort to think through dilemmas of digital spaces in a non dualistic way. The more than real concept as political, cultural, social and environmental work in assembling facets that cut across space-time compressions to produce polar activity. We know that excesses of productive and destructive forces of social change work with material entanglements to make digital geographies. The more than real then is building on new materialist thinking on the political ecology of things, including the aforementioned Jane Bennett's vibrant matter work. So this is a quote from my book, Changing Digital Geographies. As a political strategy, the more than real idea carries the potential to build an argument about the materiality of the digital and the agency of non-human digital actors. So in everyday parlance, we'd be familiar with terms like IRL in real life and how that's pitted as a binary to our digital lives and activities. This isn't something that is just in everyday parlance though as well. We see examples such as Malcolm Gladwell uh, writing in the New Yorker about how the evangelists of social media don't understand this distinction. They seem to believe that a Facebook friend is the same as a real friend. And that signing up for a donor registry in Silicon Valley today is activism in the same sense as sitting at a segregated lunch counter in Greensboro in 1960. What I would wish was that Gladwell actually talk to some of these activists to find out if this was the case, because if he has, he'd probably find out that actually, no, there's quite a nuanced understanding that most people have around what they do in digital activism. And these ideas of clicktivism have been challenged across the literature. Uh, in my early research with Soph Mousen, we fell into the trap of not reeling somewhat by using scare quotes around real, comparing that to cyber world. Uh, we were doing some research on a feminist activist group called Destroy the Joint. And this paper in 2013, published in Geographical Research, was showing how digital feminisms were vibrant and growing and how they're also changing feminist activism in Australia more broadly. So it's interesting to reflect on one's own research trajectory and how that changes over time to reveal different ways of understanding real and not real digital, non-digital spaces. I would suggest we were trying to blur those boundaries with that talk as well. So um, we might be somewhat excused. Uh, moving on, we could see a beautiful paper by Robin Longhurst, an academic from New Zealand, who shows that online communication on platforms such as Skype enable greater care of possibilities when distance separates mothers from children. In that research, she talked about how it is about hearing and seeing the lived flesh of the real person or people on the screen. In some quite different research, Busher gave the case of the elephant corridor in Southern Africa, where online hopes for supporting and creating a new space to protect elephant habitat resulted in the crowdfunding of 430,000 euro quite a substantial amount for the establishment of an elephant conservation and migration corridor. Uh, in conclusion, uh, in his research where he established, where they established that it didn't actually do much in terms of greater conservation outcomes for the elephants. And they said it's harder to see the disjunctures and hierarchies, but also whether there is any real incentive to try and see and understand these. I'd suggest that in questioning whether there are real incentives or not, we similarly fall into this binary trap of the digital as not being real. So what does the more than real idea do? I suggest that it works as a political strategy, that it can offer language to engage with tricky geographies of responsibility. Uh, as we engage in talks around the world in Zoom environments like this one, and then go home and chat to our family and friends in similar digital spaces, we can see these private public blurring, um, making quite complicated geographies. Uh, and so perhaps the more than real can help us think through these. It can generate critiques for an ethical digital infrastructure and suggest that more can be done. This image that accompanies um, this slide comes from a conference on human rights and technology that was held in Sydney, where Professor Genevieve Bell was talking about how the human is often left out of cyber physical systems or depictions of those. I would build on this argument and assert that more than humans are also often left out of the picture too frequently. When I give talks about the more than real, I'm often asked about why not the less than real. So I thought I'd canvas that now before we go on to the case study that I'll be talking about in more detail soon. 
Basically, I think it ignores um, geographies of responsibility as an idea. It doesn't tend to build on the work of more than human theorists. It lacks political clout. And it doesn't address the not wheeling, the second half of the binary that comes with the way we talk about digital geographies. So I'd like to turn to a story of digital climate action now, which is inspired by geographer Leslie Head's work on the contingency of change in the Anthropocene and her argument that we need to tell stories of what's possible that shows where agents of good in this environmental um, world, in the difficult environment, environmental world that we've created, uh, and Edward's work on digital damage and digital rhetoric. These digital stories, I think, are important. So just as a footnote before we continue, I don't think digital sustainability is something we can claim that we have right now. It's an aspirational idea, perhaps akin to something like smart cities. In the meantime, let's turn to how there are glimpses of sustainability that might be emerging through the digital. So in 2013, Australia was experiencing a very hot spring. In fact, September that year was the hottest Australian September on record, according to the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, a very respected institution, which measured that, that um, September as 2.75 degrees Celsius above the average. It was part of the hottest year on record at that time. And of course, we've had many other hottest year on record since. This led to an early start to the annual bushfire season. As this image shows, bushfires on the Blue Mountains, some 70 kilometres away from Sydney, were creating plumes of smoke that were visible from the coastline. I took this photo as, as I was on the train from Macquarie University heading over to the inner west of Sydney, heading home. I could smell the smoke seeping into the train. I could see the plume from the Blue Mountains. It was quite a spectacular, worrying sight. On a federal government level, there was considerable turbulence as well. Kevin Rudd had deposed Julie Gillard of her prime ministership before losing finally to climate skeptic Tony Abbott in September 2013. So as one of his first acts as prime minister of Australia, Tony Abbott cut all funding for the Climate Commission, an organisation that was created in 2011 by Julie Gillard as an independent body to provide reliable and authoritative information on climate change. The Climate Commission was provided with a budget of $5.4 million over four years and was headed by Commissioner Tim Flannery, Professor Will Steffen, Roger Beale, Professor Leslie Hughes and others, very serious scientists who are interested in communicating global climate science to the Australian context. And that's what they were charged to do and, and did in a very apolitical kind of a way. Of course, Australia has a record of poor action on adapting to and mitigating the impacts of climate change as reflected in its quite late uptake of carbon pricing compared to other nations. And the commission was part of a concerted effort to move away from stagnant climate change policy. The carbon tax was also a part of that. So Tony Abbott's conservative Australian government's strategic withdrawal from a previous government's policy efforts to adapt to climate change was a key electoral platform that he went into prior to taking their office, taking office. And the Climate Commission disbanding was one of his acts within the first week of being Prime Minister. The carbon tax review followed quickly thereafter and it was abolished as well. The Australian public didn't take this uh, without protest, however, and nor did the climate commissioners. We subsequently had a lot of conversation on social media, Twitter and Facebook, that stimulated the creation of the Climate Council. When the organisation was defunded, there was general outrage and disbelief that an apolitical science communication organisation would be abolished. And indeed, many people didn't really know much about the Climate Commission until it was really defunded. That certainly elevated its status and people's awareness of it. So through social media and a massive crowdfunding campaign, thousands of Australians chipped in to become founding friends of the Climate Council, together raising more than $1 million to kick off this organisation. This sample, that I present on this slide comes from that Twitter conversation that arose around the creation of the organisation, which was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, you can read more about that in that article that I cite on the screen there. So with the creation of the Climate Council, there was a lot of excitement. There was perhaps some hyperbole as well. And this is an image of Tim Flannery. Um, in front of some solar panels. Tim Flannery, along with his co-commissioners, decided that they would donate their time for free to keep the work that they were doing going. 
and they were quite fortunate to be in a position to do so. This new organisation emerged from the ashes of the Climate Commission and continues to grow today, supported by everyday people, um, both materially and discursively. The organisation uh, in, is involved in building grassroots sustainable energy solutions and these initiatives include programs such as the Cities Partnership Program, which brings councils um, on board to increase their renewable, local councils on board to increase their renewable energy uh, acquisitions. They also continue to circulate scientific reports that communicate the climate science that's relevant to the Australian context. And this is a screenshot from the early days of the Climate Council. I was involved in some research with the newly created Climate Council, reviewing data from the founding friends uh, to establish what motivated them to support this organisation and what they want the Climate Council to do going forward. The findings indicate, as this screen shows, a strong preference for sharing information on social media. Perhaps unsurprising, given that this organisation came from the social media conversations and material support through crowdfunding. What can we see as some of the results of this organisation and others like it, such as Solar Citizens, which is another digitally based group? Well, we see that Australia is a world leader in terms of solar panel installation on individual homes. Um, this is a screenshot from Clean Energy Council, which is another um, strong digital, which has another strong digital presence. And what they're showing is that 15% of homes in New South Wales have um, included solar, solar photovoltaic um, installations. So that makes Australia one of the um, global leaders in terms of solar power despite federal government uh, tardiness on this front. So I want to turn to questions of digital unsustainability now. There are other ways in which shadows form in and from our digital lives, returning to this idea from Val Plumwood. The people and places that are at the beginning of commodity chains that make and remake digital technologies are often marginalised from the benefits that the labour accrues for corporate entities. Research from Chan and Cole describe how Apple, as an example, purport to have ethical digital production practices, but evidence has shown otherwise, including the case of tin extraction in Indonesia, where unsafe and illegal labor conditions have endangered lives and children, of children and others who have been exposed to hazardous waste. With this in mind, what can we see as some of the challenges for sustainable digital lives? I think that bringing on board this idea of the more than real, uh, we often think of the digital as not real and immaterial. We think of them as a useful environmental solution because that's how they're often advertised and packaged. And they're very convenient as well, of course. So there's that important point. Some of the other challenges come from the lack of controllable levers. There are diffuse technologies that are networked. Um, it's very hard to ascertain whether a data centre is environmentally responsible or not, let alone recognising them in the urban or rural landscapes in which they're sited. There are rapid changes in digital technologies all the time, um, and without sustainability is a core focus for many of these changes. We could very easily turn that challenge into a strength though, because of these rapid changes, surely including sustainability as a core focus is something that is quite feasible if they're constantly being churned into new products and new innovations, then including sustainability and you know, substantively including sustainability could be something that could be achieved. Another challenge comes from the stories that we tell ourselves about the digital. We purport to believe in these things as sustainable and safe. Digital corporations want us to believe those stories as well because they keep their bottom line going strongly. And you know, arguments around greenwashing, of course, um, play a part here, thinking back to that Optus sustainability scorecard, for instance. Um, there are also the global qualities of digital corporations that have limited responsibility to local populations. There might also be limited awareness and or interest. These distant or intangible technologies that create our digital ecosystems, increasing, supporting our increasing consumption, we might not really be that invested in thinking about them as being sustainable or not, because it's just another problem that we'd have to deal with. And all of that um, comes with a 
with critique, but also a recognition that it's fair enough. People are hectic and this isn't an individual's problem. This is a, a corporation and government problem. And that's where the issues should be addressed and um, changed. Of course, this isn't a new issue. So Florida way back in 2001 was talking about how sustainable development means that uh, the sound construction of the infosphere must be associated with an equally important ethical concern for the way in which the latter affects and interacts with the physical environment, biosphere and human life in general, both positively, for example, telework as a solution for traffic and fuel pollution, and negatively, for example, rising energy consumption, ICT generated waste, computer related forms of illness. So I want to situate these critiques within longer critiques, including Florida's, but also critiques applied to other technologies. So the digital isn't uh, necessarily this exceptional area that these critiques exist within. But I do think that some of the immateriality that we use to think about digital technologies is particular and needs different consideration. So thinking about digital technologies, and these more than real negotiations of sustainable discourses. Uh, we can see that there's a politics of inaction on climate change in wealthy countries like Australia and the United States. Um, digital technologies are subject to these as well. And perhaps it's more concentrated within the digital tech world. Many corporations are confused and or in denial about the environmental impacts of their technologies. Um, for instance, Amazon continues to support the fossil fuel industry and yet uh, doing things like buying 10,000 electric trucks to make their um, business environmentally safe or better. Uh, and then they have Amazon workers who are joining the school strike, say in September 2019, uh, and Amazon workers for climate justice. So we have these contradictions internally and um, what that does for what a corporation does and how it uh, fulfills these discourses is really interesting, I think. Uh, someone like uh, corporations like Apple have a 100% renewable energy claim, but actually it's often just offsets. So we know through critiques from people like George Monbiot that offsets are a bit like moving food around on your plate. They don't actually do much to address the environmental impacts of increased carbon emissions and tend to help soothe the conscience of uh, rich people and continue their consumptive practices. Uh, coming to the Australian context, we can see governments such as Australia's pushing artificial intelligence disruptions and not really considering the digital tech cost benefits in consistent ways. So um, we have this continued push towards more um, digital disruption and still leaving behind any environmental questions around that, let alone addressing climate change policy in a consistent way. What's really interesting, I think, is the academic literature as well that talks to sustainability discourses within digital tech. Um, that aforementioned piece by Kunzman and Rattle, which does a really nice overview of the literature on sustainability and digital communications, shows that there's not much overlap in these areas. And so um, if academics aren't asking these questions and digital corporations are given, giving tokenistic um, gestures towards sustainability, we can see that there are some significant gaps at play there. Uh, this image on this slide comes from a screenshot from Twitter where Mike Cannon Brooks, who is head of Atlassian, an Australian um, tech company that's been very successful, um, is showing his anger and frustration towards Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister. And um, Scott Morrison, the um, screenshot within Mike Cannon Brooks' tweet, uh, had just finished a video where he was uh, talking about getting electricity prices down. And he was using examples of everyday folk who were wanting to have fair dingham power. They didn't believe, he said that they didn't believe in things like renewable energy, including solar and wind, and that fair dingham power from coal and gas was more important and more significant uh, in terms of securing Australia's energy future. So Mike is critiquing this claim and starting a new movement uh, called fair dingham power within a couple of hours of tweeting this, he'd set up a website and started actively campaigning for Australia to become an actual renewable energy exporter rather than a laggard in this area. So we see these interesting 
disjunctures and conflicts emerging between powerful tech and powerful politics and what that means in terms of the more than real uh, I think it's definitely still playing out but it's noteworthy to see that some of the contradictions of the more than real play out in surprising ways um, continually. So the affordances of digital spaces are complex. The potential of being heard and claiming ground can be countered by attention fatigue and the reproduction of power relations. Environmental ben benefits can be subsumed by the costs of exponential growth of digital consumption. Continuing to argue for the materiality and partiality of digital things is one way that these paradoxes can be navigated. Similarly, grounding the digital in particular geographies and histories could bring to light the tricky ways in which particular problems emerge. If we seek out and listen to the stories that come with digital things, the shadows that accompany them may be known as well. So Dustin Edwards asked us to think again about digital damage, an idea that is perhaps simpatico to digital shadows, and reflects on the case of a data centre in New Mexico, showing how the water and energy required to maintain this centre is extracted from colonised lands. To return to Plumwood's thinking on shadow places once more, how might we think about bringing to light that which is so often overlooked and ignored? These issues are not individual concerns. We cannot individualise problems that are actually structural. The responsibility to make our digital lives more sustainable shouldn't be reduced to that scale. Rather, governments should work to make the more than real a part of sustainable futures by pushing for renewables and other organisations should divest from fossil fuels. An easy substantial intervention would be for governments to outwell planned obsolescence in the construction and design of digital devices. There are some gestures towards this already. Italy has fined Apple and Samsung for making smartphones that are not designed to last. There is much more to be done, of course. Corporations can be held to account and the monstrous power that the Googles of the world hold could be challenged with ideas of things such as good enough internet. These are workable alternatives that aren't out of reach. So that's a list of references and thanks for your attention today. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we're going to open it up to questions and I'll also have a question to start us off. And thank you to the two audience members who have already asked a question. Um, Sophie will read your questions aloud in a moment and I want to invite everyone else who is participating tonight to also ask questions in the question box. So um, I guess I'll kick us off um, with one question um, that I was thinking about when you were talking. Um, you opened up this talk by speaking about the role of statistics in tracking carbon emissions and kinds of carbon footprints um, with the Qantas example. And I'm interested if you can speak a little bit more about how you see the relationship between this emphasis on quantification mm -hmm. and statistics and the relationship with the more than real. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks, Alex. I think it's interesting to try to put some numbers around these things because it dispels some of the immateriality or intangibility that comes with thinking about these digital geographies, even though those numbers sort of mean nothing as well. <laughs> like it's really hard to imagine the scale of, um, you know, exponential increase in uh, internet usage, right? And these numbers are somewhat unfathomable. Um, what I guess I want to do in trying to add a quantification aspect to this idea of the more than real is to claim back some of that territory that tends to sit with the big data positivists of the world and suggest that, okay, well, if we unpack what's actually happening in terms of our everyday digital lives and these consumption practices, put some sort of a figure to them and have them as analogous to other forms of technologies that we use all the time, then we can rest back this idea that it, it is cloud-based, it is um, not something that we can grab hold onto by using metaphors such as, you know, one artificial intelligence machine equating to five cars over a person's, um, over the lifetime of their use, that we can sort of ground this information in a way, uh, which is interesting. But I, but I do think that there are also problems in that because it's, um, you know, you're always chasing these equations and figures <laughs> that are dubious and contested. Um, but I, 
I guess it's my geographic training coming in where uh, I was, you know, trained as a, a scientist in my undergraduate as well as a, an arts, um, someone in the arts. I did gender studies and anthropology as well as um, physical geography and human geography. So, so to not give some sort of idea around the materiality of these things, um, I think is limiting. Yeah, so, so I guess that's why it's interesting when thinking through what the more than real is and can be, because it um, gives some sort of um, a base or, or some sort of um, tangibility to these ideas that can seem amorphous. Thank you so much uh, for that response. I think Sophie has the first question and I, we're just gonna read people's first names uh, to protect their identity, I think. Hi, um, I have a question from Seely who says, I love references when possible on sites like the British Open University Professors on Data Center and AI versus uh, a car. Um, I think that this maybe would have been something to talk about in the moment, but maybe you have some um, examples of citations related to uh, these, these topics. Yeah, so the Struble one is on the um, reference list. The Norton one came from a Guardian article, which um, I, I can email to you and you can also Google it as well. Uh, here I am suggesting more Googling. Um, but um, yeah, and I mean, I could actually also update the reference list. I just realized then that the Norton one is included there um, to, to give that data um, in, in the reference list, if you like. Great. Um, I, I guess I'll ask the next question and then we can go back and forth just to change the sound of voices. Um, so a question from Soana. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Soana asks, Apple is probably a champion when it comes to planned obsolescence. And you mentioned this a bit when you were talking about Italy. Um, so how should we think about it and what can we do to not burden developing countries with our e-waste? Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question. The e-waste literature is quite extensive in the area of digital geographies. And it is something that people have been resting with in terms of activism as well. People, there have been e-waste um, management campaigns and certainly growing awareness around the world of this issue. I think that the planned obsolescence issue is a really really important one and something that um, we need to you know spend more time with I, I think that too easily co companies like Apple get away with their 100% renewable claims without you know actually looking at the whole commodity chain analysis and taking into account the fact that it's not just about energy consumption and production that comes with digital technologies it's also about the metals the plastic the glass um, all of these material things that are a part of the digital ecosystems that give us this glorious thing, the internet. Um, so, so I think that Apple has to be called to account for these um, issues and it's something that, uh, that um, governments need to <laughs> apply, such as Italy, um, which has, like I said, um, challenged Samsung and Apple for their planned obsolescence and actually find them. So individual, um, nations around the world could be addressing this in their legal processes as well as individual consumers and activist groups suggesting that we don't accept these claims of environmental championship and that um, more and better can be done. Thank you. Sophie, would you like to read the next one? Yeah, thank you so much about that, with that answer. Um, Samana again asks, I have been listening to a lot of podcasts and reading a lot of books and articles on climate change and healthy, a healthy amount of those advocate, advocate for technological innovation. If new tech isn't a sustainable solution for climate change, what should we be focusing on? Is this a lifestyle change? Are there studies to show how the correlation, correlation between lifestyle change and greenhouse gas emissions? Um, thanks. Yeah, so that's really interesting, isn't it? That digital solutionism is put forward as a, an environmental way to 
you know, manage our unsustainable lives. It's, it's nice to hear that other people are reading this too. Because sometimes they think, oh, I'm just obsessed about this thing that no one else is really worried about. <laughs> um, but no, it, it is the case that often digital solutions are put forward um, for environmental dilemmas. And look, in some cases, it might be true that, um, say, using iPads instead of 20 kilogram flight manuals on a Qantas plane is a more environmentally sustainable option. My claim and my critique comes from the fact that we don't actually do the analysis of what the environmental impacts of the iPad is in that, um, in that equation. So it's, it's not a very sophisticated argument in some ways, it's just a basic one. Can we do a proper cost benefit analysis of this digital technology that's replacing the paper um, that was being used? So that's one thing I'd point out. Um, the other thing is that there are things we can do that make digital technologies more sustainable. So for instance, 100% renewable energy is one way in which we could make our digital lives better for the environment. And that's something, um, you know, obviously there are forms of better and worse um, renewable energy. Say I'm not a proponent of dams. I think that hydropower is really problematic uh, for the river health and for local people who rely on uh, water for their livelihoods and the, um, fish and non-fish products that come from healthy rivers. Um, but that aside, looking at 100% renewable energy and having that as a part of our digital ecosystem is one material way that we could make digital tech more sustainable. Um, other ways are encouraging um, and enforcing corporations to have carriage of whole of life um, uh, environmental responsibility for the goods that they produce. And, you know, there's huge um, literature on the particular, like I said, the e-waste issue that we raised before, that's something um, that's important, but um, lots of people have been thinking about as well. So, so yeah, I think I answered your question. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I think I'm getting a, uh, there, there was another part to your question, the second part to the question, which I can't remember, sorry. I think that that answers the question for the most part. Um, let me just reread the question to make sure. Um, and also yeah. the next question also kind of builds on that question a bit too, um, in which Anonymous asks, um, in Canada, we see a political trend to innovate ourselves out of the climate crisis. I see these technical solutions to climate change as the idea that we can consume our way out of our crisis, when in reality, we need to consume less. Can we reconcile the need to consume less and the technological imperative towards the new and ever faster consumption that are bundled up in this? or that are bundled up, yeah, bundled up in this. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's related to the last question, but perhaps if you want to um, expand upon this. A bit yeah, more. That's, that's another great question. I, I, I'm thinking of eco-modernist solutions to the environmental dilemmas that we're in, right? That we can take our way out of these unsustainable lives. And it, when we get that next bit of technology, then the environmental dilemmas that we're in they will have been fixed because we've got the solution or, or we just need to apply that right technology and that will fix things. Um, and we know that actually it's, it's a bigger structural issue. It's, it's a, perhaps uh, about capitalism. And, you know, if we take work like Naomi Klein's and many other um, commentary and academics looking at the critiques of overly consumptive lives, capitalist driven consumption, um, then, we need to change the system, right? It's, that it's broken. So, so I think that that's that's a really important point. It, it's not about buying more, or, you know, or finding that tech solution to um, solve these things. Often, it's a lack of political will that's the real problem. More information might not necessarily change anything. It just gives more information. Uh, if people aren't implementing policy changes and if corporations are continuing to just extract profit from unsustainable practices, then we keep reproducing these same systems. So you can see where these um, really valid critiques come from. And I, I think, you know, in terms of things that we can control, you know, we could stretch out the life of our individual pieces of technology. And, you know, if you have a phone that isn't working 100%, maybe just deal with it for a little bit longer. Um, or, you know, if you work in an organisation that enforces replacement of computers every two years, perhaps ask for a structural change there that it could be every three or four years um, and try to stretch out that technology 
a little bit longer. So those are very micro kind of interventions that we could feel that are useful. But yeah, like I said, it, it's much more of a structural thing. Uh, and I, I don't think individualizing the problem is particularly useful or fair. Thank you for that. Um, there's no other um, questions in the Q&A, but I'm wondering if there was anything else that you wish had been asked that you wanted to expand upon. That I wish I had that would have been asked. That, oh. Yeah, yeah, of you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have been so bold as to. <laughs> I'm happy to keep going with the Q and A's. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's it's really interesting conversation that's coming from people's um, engagement with this talk. So yeah. Um, I guess we'll give people another couple of seconds to type in a question. <laughs> No one's posted anything in the last seven minutes, though, so um, we might be wrapping up right now. Okay, it doesn't seem like anyone else is typing a question. Um, Sophie, did you have any other questions or? I was really interested in um, what you were saying about sort of shifting. Um, sorry, th these ideas of, you know, digital corporations wanting to keep their their uh, unsustainable practices sort of in the dark and you know these um, sorry I'm trying to word my question properly um, and the 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 you know the environmental impact of these digital technologies sort of being obscured by uh, offsetting these costs or these these detriments in other ways and I was kind of wondering how you think this could be better communicated to the public um, either by, you know, political figures, uh, by the academy, outside of the academy. It's sort of yeah. maybe a little bit um, ironic that perhaps this could be done through digital means, through digital <laughs> activism, right? So I was wondering yeah. how you're thinking about that um, as you try and communicate these ideas uh, to a larger public so that people understand uh, yeah. this is happening. That's a really interesting question. Thanks, Sophie. I think um, we can see examples like Greenpeace. They've been producing reports up until a couple of years ago on green IT and actually rating particular corporations, including those that manage data centres in terms of their environmental stewardship. Uh, so those sort of campaigns are, have been ongoing. I don't think they've done them in the last couple of years. In Australia, there's been an interesting program called War on Waste that was on the national broadcaster, ABC, um, and that was a very successful and very interesting um, television series and also campaign that got everyone from kids to older people engaged with thinking about um, all sorts of technologies, including the digital. One of the scenes Craig Rewcastle had was a car driving around downtown Sydney with um, mobile phones all attached to it. And so visually bringing to light some of these um, digital waste issues that we often don't see because they're in the tip out at Lucas Heights rather than in the centre of Sydney. So, so there are these efforts that are ongoing and need to be, um, you know, talked about and paid attention to. Uh, and I guess, you know, there are other ways that we could do these conversations as well, such as a point of purchase of these um, particular um, things. We could have, you know, five star rating systems that we have for other forms of technology. Uh, which is a really basic way of doing it. I know that there's collection of dead mobile phones and those sorts of things that happens um, in Australia. I'm not sure if that happens in Canada, um, but they seem to be quite um, ad hoc and piecemeal. So, so perhaps a more coordinated um, campaign could be useful. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> During that, we received two more questions and I think these will be the final two to wrap up um, this uh, event. Uh, so Amelia asks, are you aware of any geographers combining the environmental issues of the digital with the well-being issues of all the digital time lately? Oh, <laughs> that's a, it's a really good question. I, I, there was a really interesting issue of dialogues in human geography, which included a lot of the human social geographic aspects of our digital lives, um, but didn't have much about the environmental things. So, so that's, that's noteworthy. Um, I think that, yeah, it, it tends to be the case that 
similar to the way sustainability and digital communications research sit in parallel, that kind of happens in geography as well. Um, I could well be missing something though, of course. So I, I'm constantly amazed by the breadth and depth of research that's happening out there. So um, if someone finds something, please let me know. I'd love to read it. And I can read the last one. Um, or actually, we've got two more questions. One is from Florence, which is, could you expand on the concepts of the more than real versus the less than real? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, the only reason I present that is because in other talks, when I've talked about the more than real, someone goes, why are you calling it that? It should be the less than real because these digital lives are, are not as um, real as the face to face. And for me, the more than real does political work, which I think is interesting, and the less than real doesn't so much. Um, it also tends to really stabilise ideas of the digital as being not real. I think we've got a lot of work to do around the use of terms like IRL and even virtual. I hate the term virtual. Uh, and, and so what I think the more than real does is highlight and politically intervene in that kind of uh theoretical mistake or that practical mistake that we make when we think of the digital as not real uh, and you know some people just hate it which is fine <laughs> but i think that it has a, a lot of space for taking the agency that comes with say the more than human literature which is what it really stands on the shoulders of um, and i encourage you to seek out work by sarah watmore um, and gazillions of others, human, human geographers who have done work on the more than human uh, to get a sense of why the more than real works um, alongside in parallel to this idea but is applied to digital spaces. Yeah, I've heard the term uh, outside of computer or away from computer as an alternative to IRL versus URL, um, which I like. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one but I can't remember who that was from. Um, but the last question from an anonymous user is, uh, can you speak a bit about the, the issues of privacy and censorship in the digital and how that limits radical activism and environmental campaigning? Wow, great question. Yeah, it is a great question. And it's something people have written books on, <laughs> of course. So um, whatever I say here is gonna be, you know, just very much touching the surface. I, I think that obviously, um, you know, surveillance is one of these big issues in digital geographies today. And indeed most um, digital geographic, a lot of digital geographic research looks at this area um, and media studies as well, you know, you know, sister field. I think that um, in the research that I did for my book, Changing Digital Geographies, I found that the activists I was working with and learning from we're quite comfortable with using these technologies to achieve their activist goals. And they did them quite strategically, these campaigns quite strategically and engaged with these tools through really informed positions. So they were well aware of the constraints and the surveillance that happened, but also um, were able to exploit these technologies to achieve their ends. So I think the savviness of digital activism now is such that even though we have problems and constraints in terms of surveillance and control in these um, technologies, we also have um, strategic engagement and um, quite, quite powerful interventions that recognise these constraints but then push back against them. So I think that that's certainly from the people who I interviewed and from the data that I looked at in um, building research for my book and uh, I think that being limited by these very serious and you know inappropriate surveillance issues um, is something people are aware of but then they also challenge so so I think it's really interesting to see how people do that in significant ways. Well thank you so much um, for your talk and for the question and answer period. Thank you to everyone who participated and if you had any friends who wanted to attend but weren't able to, we will have a video version of this event posted within the next couple of days. We'll circulate that 
on our social media as well. And you can also see videos of past events. I want to thank Jessica McLean again for doing this talk. Thank you so much. And for everyone else, remember we have upcoming events in the following three Wednesdays. You, if you're interested in topics of techno solutionism, um, check out our event on November 4th with Meredith Broussard. Um, next week is Alice Wong, and November 11th is Joy Lisi Rankin. Thank you so much again, everyone, um, for attending. Thank you. Thanks, Alex.